This year at the First Baptist Church of San Antonio, we're looking deeper into the second greatest commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. When we love our neighbors well, we build a stronger, more connected community. And this community includes you. Whether you're in the city limits of San Antonio or watching all over South Texas, we want you to be a part of this with us. Come be a part of what God is doing in the heart of downtown San Antonio. Turn with me to our text for today, John 14, 6. As we begin to, into a new Bible study series, we'll be talking about life, what life is meant to be, what life God intends for us. And as we begin this series, we're going to start with John 14, 6 and this life that Jesus provides. So if you find that in your listening sheet, stand with me, and we're going to read this aloud together. This then is the text for today. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. May God bless the reading of his word. There's really nothing like sitting under an old tree. There seems to be something spiritual about sitting under ancient branches that have provided shade for hundreds of years. It's a, it's a holy experience to sit under a tree like that when you see these massive trees that, that have been on this earth for hundreds of years, if not for thousands. In fact, recently I saw an, saw an article about the tree that's believed to be the oldest tree on earth. It's in California in the White Mountains, and it's reported or estimated to be some 4,800 years old, a bristlecone pine that was alive when Abraham was still Abram, encompassing most all of human history. It's a, a marvel how God's creation stands. An ancient tree breathing in the same air that our ancestors have. It's interesting, as we, we come to Genesis, Genesis speaks of an ancient tree. And it, and it points back to who God is and what God is doing among us. And so we'll start there in Genesis chapter two. We'll have it on the screen. In Genesis chapter two, verse nine. Pastor Aaron read it earlier, uh, or alluded to it earlier. Out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that's pleasing to the side and good for food. And then the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This ancient tree of life, there's a lot of mystery that surrounds it. And in fact, there's a, there's a lot of questions when we come to Genesis 2 about what God was doing. How, how God did these things. Why did God orient life in such a way? And this morning, instead of speculating on those questions, I think it's important for us today to recognize what God says intentionally to us about life. That at, at the, the heart of this garden that he had created was this tree. And it gives us a description to help, a, help us understand what God was doing, this, this tree of life. And, and just in the verses before that, that we saw up on the screen, just before that you see God create man out of the dust of the earth, but, but there's, no, there's no life in him. In fact, it, it's just a sort of corpse and it says that, that God then breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. 
And as, as, as breath comes into the man, it is a gift of God. And, and, and man then is invigorated by God himself. And not only in that moment, in this initial breath of God, but God then so sets the atmosphere so that it is exact for this one to survive and for humanity to grow. And, and as it says, it says that God created this garden, a beautiful and perfect paradise where everything was provided that was necessary for Adam and Eve to thrive. This wasn't just about survival. God didn't create Adam and then Eve so that they could scratch and claw their way into some kind of existence they created for themselves. It was just the exact opposite. As they were invigorated into life, God set everything in its place, everything perfect, holy, the necessary things, the elements, the nourishment was all perfectly set in its place so that they could thrive where they had been set, where they would have a beautiful and perfect life as full as God intended for them. And it would be grand. Everything set in its place. And there in the heart of that garden, this ancient tree of life that represented that existence of fullness, a wealth beyond anything we've ever known, there for Adam and for Eve. You know, often we come to moments in life, though, where, where we feel lacking, where life feels lesser, and, and we feel like life is sort of compressed down in a way that keeps us restrained and, and apart from that which is good. We come to these moments in life where we are in deep valleys and it doesn't feel full. In fact, it feels like a waste. It, it feels like we're impoverished of spirit. We're impoverished of relationships, that, that we're nowhere near what we could be or what we should be. And often when we come to these lows and these deep depressions, we look up and we blame God and we say, God, why did you do this to me? We blame God for our lack. We blame God for what is less than. But it's God who gave us the tree of life. When we look back on this story, the biblical story as a whole, but in particular moving back into Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, every bit of lack that we experience, the pain that we know, the struggles that we face, every single one of them go back to Adam's sin. Not to God's intention, but to the waywardness of mankind. That it, it's our own decision making that brings this lack and brings this struggle and makes life less of what it should be. In fact, it's, it's a pretty incredible scene as Adam and Eve are moved out of the garden because once sin comes in, there is punishment for them and they're removed from the garden. And what does it say down in Genesis 3, 24? It, it says there, as they are taken out of the garden, something happens to the tree of life. It says that God places cherubim there at the tree to protect it and to keep it. It says there are flaming swords so that it becomes completely inaccessible to man. That in our sin, we are cut off from life. In our sin, we are cut off from eternity. In our sin, we are cut off from our God and we are kept away in and because of our sin so that the lack we know the, the scraping by existence that we have to deal with, when we face the deep and mounting struggles of this life, it is, direct, is a direct result of our sin, not of God's intent. But it's a direct result of our own decision making that goes all the way back to our ancestral roots in Adam and Eve. Sin makes the tree of life inaccessible. And you might think that that's the last we hear of the tree of life. That if it is cut off in such a way that mankind has been excluded from this tree of life, 
we think it would drift into the pages of biblical history. But praise the Lord, the tree of life shows up again. In fact, look with me at Revelation chapter two, verse seven. He who has an ear, let him hear. This is, this is Jesus' words as he begins the words to the churches in Revelation, Revelation two and three, and he's speaking to the churches. Let him hear what the Spirit of, says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant what? I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Do you, do you hear what Jesus is saying here? That these angelic warriors that were stationed at the tree of life to protect it from you and I, these angelic warriors and the flaming swords that stand with them are servants of the Lord our God and Jesus Christ, that they operate at the command of Jesus. And Jesus Christ moves freely between the two. And he can walk right past those centuries to the tree of life and, and take of it for us. And in fact, as we're working through the biblical story, as, as we have brought lack, impoverishment, a lesser life unto death, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you wanna know what full life looks like, if you wanna know what abundant life means, it's found only in the person of Jesus Christ. As we come to our text this week, John 14, six, it says, no one comes to the Father but by me. So if you wanna walk past the cherubim and eat of the tree of life, you come with me. Otherwise, you are completely cut off. And, and this is the story of human history. Sin cuts us off, but Jesus brings us home. Sin brings death to this life, but Jesus resurrects us from the grave so that we can have a new life in him. Jesus says he's the one who's gonna make all things right in your life. When you are at your lowest lows, in the deepest valleys, impoverished of spirit, impoverished of relationships, Jesus will pick you up and hold you close to him and make all things new. As the incarnate Christ, the Son of God, this was his purpose in the incarnation, is to make these things right and holy. And he picks you up, and he walks you into eternity to eat of the tree of life. Look at another text with me, Revelation 22.2. We'll have it up on the screen here. So the river in the middle of the street, and on either side of the river was this tree of life. And what you'll notice is there's this unique picture of a tree that, that we get here in Revelation 22. So as we're picturing this eternity in this new reality of life, he's saying, come to this tree. And the, the tree, it's on, on either side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every single month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. This tree is unlike anything we've known. It's, it's distributed in ways we wouldn't see a tree grow. It has fruit in ways we wouldn't normally see fruit on a tree. Every single month, every single season, there is ripe fruit ready for you to eat. And, and where Revelation is pointing us is that God's intention for his children is this full life in eternity where this, this, this tree of abundance that is always your provision is available. Every month of the year, there is not a season without fruit so that you can come and take and be refreshed. And you can have this full life that you've been lacking. That, that you, you can have this hope that has been gone from your life. It, it's available in and through Jesus Christ. And what you see on either side of history is this ancient tree growing, providing everything we could possibly ever need. And what you recognize there in, in Revelation 22, not only is it providing fruit, it says it is a source of healing. And in particular, a source of healing among the nations. Then what we recognize there, and we see it all over the news today, and we see it all throughout history, that nations have this tendency to war. 
Nations have a tendency to butt heads and be at odds with one another. Peace is a rare thing. And nations regularly come to these moments of bloodshed. And what Jesus is pointing us to here in the fullness of our life, all relationships are restored as God would have them be. That your relationships are this moment of strength and holiness. They're provision for your life. And the, these healing leaves are the healing of these, uh, these relationships that have been broken for generations. Borders that have been fought over for centuries. There's healing in the leaves of the tree of Christ. And for every place that we don't know peace, for every place there is conflict in our lives, for every relationship that is broken, whether individual or corporate, the, the leaves of the tree of life are what we need. And Jesus is saying it, it's here. It's here and it's available for you. And it's only found in the person of Jesus Christ. You will hear people all around you and all around us saying there are other ways to come to peace. There are other ways to nourish your soul. And the scripture that we learn from every day says that is a lie straight from Satan himself. Our only peace and our only nourishment comes directly from Jesus Christ himself because he is the only remedy that we have for sin. In fact, I wanna look at one more text, Galatians 3.13. Here on the screen, we don't often think about the crucifixion in these terms, but it's, it's appropriate for today to go to Galatians 3 and think about the crucifixion as a tree. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. This is that sin that makes life lesser and lacking, having become a curse for us. So Jesus takes that curse and the burden of sin, the penalty of sin upon himself, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So this picture that we get in Galatians is you, you have the, the crucifixion as, as the this, this center of human history, that the crucifixion is what everything else in this life hinges on. And then when this life is at its worst, when we are at our lowest, when there's nothing else more for us to do or go to in this life, when, when, when we can't go on any further, Further, we cling to the cross of Jesus Christ and life will be full. Because the reality is that every other way that we attempt and, and we, we try to, to redeem our own lives and we try to restore our own lives, it, it only causes us to slip further back into destruction. It causes us to just further know lack. For every bit of progress we think we make, we slide back down into death. And the only remedy is for us to cling to the cross of Jesus Christ who was cursed on this tree on our behalf. And, and the, the branches of the crucifixion, they, they stretch out over humanity so that all who come under the shadow of the cross are healed and they're made new and they're given life they've never known before. And, and Jesus tells us clearly here in John 14, these are the life-giving branches you need. And the only place that you're ever going to find life on this earth is in the shadow of the cross. That if, if, you, will, if you will come from wherever you are today, if, if, you would, if you would come to the cross and find the blood of Jesus there, you will be saved. He's saying this, this, this is a tree of life in between the life-giving branches that we need while we remain on this earth. And, and what Jesus is, is, is telling us there from the crucifixion to the resurrection is that in him you have everything you will ever need in this life. That God has made it clear from the beginning and the end. We see it in Genesis and we see it in Revelation. He is gonna provide for your every need far more than you can imagine. He is a physical provider, providing the, the nourishment that you need, the, the, the food that you need, the oxygen that you need. God is always providing for his children. He does not fail us and he has never failed us in that way. There is a provision from God that gives you the fullness that you need and that you can never achieve on your own. But in the same way, there's a deeper spiritual need beyond the physical need. 
that's provided in the person of Jesus Christ. That, that he's gonna take care of all of that spiritual deficit and, and the weight of guilt that is crushing us and, and suffocating us and eventually killing us that Jesus comes in and by his nail-scarred hands, he takes that off of us and redeems us out of death into a newness of life. This is who your God is and who our God is for. He's gonna come and be your provision and bring you a full life like you've never known. If, if and when life feels like something is missing, or if and when life feels like it is a chaotic spiral, if and when life feels down and dreadful, the promise of Jesus in our scripture is that if you come to the cross, you'll find new life like you've never known before. Let's do that this morning together. Come into the shadow of the cross. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your provision. When you set such a tree It was a promise. And it was a revelation of your character. And Lord, we know you are a life-giving God. And we pray that every one of us today would experience that life-giving nature, that we would taste of the sweet fruit of heaven, and that our lives would be restored. Lord, we pray this morning if there is any lack among us, Lord, any way that we are experiencing a lesser life, Lord, we pray that your spirit would come and heal. Lord, that by your spirit you would make us whole. Lord, redeem us from sin and death that we may walk in newness of life. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.